Opal is pleased to share a conversation with two people with expertise in addressing one of humanity's greatest challenges, nuclear weapons. Dr. William Perry, former U.S. Secretary of Defense, speaks with the authority of years of experience and successes. My friend Jonathan Granoff is a leader in advancing the rule of law to achieve a safer world order. He serves as president of the Global Security Institute, is representative to the United Nation of the World Summits of Nobel Peace Laureates, and is a senior advisor to the Committee on National Security of the International Law Section of the American Bar Association. Thank you very much. Um, it's an honor to introduce someone whom I consider to be a mentor and an elder on the planet. And by an elder, I mean someone who's, who has evidenced the application of wisdom in the affairs of human beings and spends his time in educating the rest of us on how we can be more effective in improving the condition of the world. Dr. Perry, he has a doctorate in high math. Dr. Perry's career is truly unique. It ranges from being a, a professor, where he is presently now at Stanford, um, an engineer, uh, a banker, an extremely successful businessman. Back in the late 1970s, he helped dramatically when he was undersecretary uh, of, uh, of, of defense in helping bring our, uh, the defense departments from an analog system to a digital system. And out of the work that he did, that he led, we have our GPS system. So to, to a major extent, Dr. Perry's work in the Silicon Valley has produced enormous benefits to all of us. This very Zoom call depends on that digital technology. When he was Secretary of Defense, I would say he was the most successful Secretary of Defense that we've ever had because it was in a transition period coming out of the Cold War and he was instrumental in dramatically reducing not only the posture of nuclear weapons, but the number of nuclear weapons. After his retirement from being Secretary of Defense, he hasn't given, given up one, one moment uh, uh, of, of, of sitting on his laurels. And he was one of the principals in the very important uh, initiative and op-eds of Secretary Schultz, Sec former Secretary of State Schultz, uh, Senator Sam Nunn, and Henry Kissinger in a series of very important op-eds that they did in the Wall Street Journal calling for progress in the elimination of nuclear weapons. Without taking up any more time from someone I think we all need to learn from, I now have the privilege of introducing one of, one of my mentors and uh, examples of, 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 of how we should live, uh, Dr. William Perry. Please, Dr. Perry. Thank, thank you very much, Jonathan. On this very day, 75 years ago, an atomic bomb detonated over Hiroshima. The city was destroyed and more than 70,000 people killed instantly. The world had never seen or even imagined such a force for destruction. Albert Einstein observed that with the advent of the nuclear bomb, everything, everything has changed except our way of thinking. But over a period of several decades, my way of thinking did change. And what that change led me to believe that nuclear weapons were an existential threat to our civilization and motivated me to begin a crusade to abolish them. Today, I will tell you about four events in my life that create, changed my thinking about nuclear weapons. I was just 17 and returning to my college dormitory from a class in differential equations when I heard the news that a powerful bomb had been dropped on Hiroshima. A few months later, I turned 18 and joined the Army. And after my training, I was sent to Japan as part of the Army of Occupation. I will never forget my first visit to Tokyo. The city had been destroyed by firebombs and the massive rebuilding program had not yet started. I reflected that the horror I was witnessing in Tokyo had been inflicted by thousands of planes 
hundreds of thousands of bombs over a period of more than a year. But that equivalent devastation had been inflicted on Hiroshima with one plane, one bomb, in an instant. And that is when my thinking did begin to change. I was beginning to understand that with the advent of the nuclear bomb, everything indeed had changed. Even at 18, I understood that nuclear weapons must never, ever be used again. A few months later, my unit was sent to Okinawa, the site of the last great battle of World War II. The fighting had been unbelievably fierce in Okinawa. <clears throat> About 100,000 Japanese soldiers defending the island, only 10% survived, only 10%. The rest were killed in battle or committed suicide. And at least 100,000 Okinawan civilians perished. I watched in disbelief as my ship landed in Naha, the capital city of Okinawa. Not a building was left standing. In the coming months, I traveled all over the island conducting surveying operations. The civilians who had escaped death were living in poverty, their homes and farms destroyed by the fighting. So my boorish fantasies about the glory of war were soon replaced by the stark realities of the horror of war. The second transformative event of my life occurred during the height of the Cold War. The year was 1962. I was the director of an electronics laboratory in California and was also a pro bono scientific consultant to our government. When I got a call from the deputy director of CIA asking me to come in to visit him as soon as possible, I told him I would rearrange my schedule and see him the following Monday. And he said, no, you don't understand. I need to see you right away. So I got on the red eye and flew back to Washington. Next morning, I went into his office and there on his desk were a series of photographs. U2 photographs. As I looked at the pictures, I instantly recognized that these were Soviet missiles under deployment in Cuba. And that was my first inkling of what came to be called the Cuban Missile Crisis. He asked me if I would lead a small analysis team whose job would be to write a report for President Kennedy every morning on his desk. The reconnaissance planes were flying over Cuba in the morning. The photographs were flown back to Eastman Kodak who quickly processed them and sent them to Washington. They arrived shortly after lunch at our analysis center. And our team worked until about midnight studying all of those data and all other intelligence we had available so that we could prepare a report for Senator President Kennedy that would tell him the state of readiness of those Soviet missiles. Kennedy was being urged by his military leaders to conduct a conventional military operation against Cuba, but he was resisting that. He wanted to use diplomacy as long as he could. He resisted it because he feared that a conventional known attack would escalate quickly into a nuclear war, a war that could annihilate all of our civilization. So our job was to give him as much information as possible so, to, so that he could delay that decision as long as possible and in the meantime, conduct diplomacy. President Kennedy, after the event was over, <clears throat> offered the opinion that the likelihood of the Cuban Missile Crisis erupting into a nuclear catastrophe was about one chance in three, one chance in three for the end of our civilization. But the bad news was his estimate was optimistic because when he made it, he did not know, because we did not know, that the Soviets beside those medium range missiles not yet operational, already had tactical missiles with nuclear warheads on them, ready to go, operational and on full authority for launch. So if he had accepted that recommendation, our troops would have been decimated on the beachhead with tactical nuclear weapons and a general nuclear war would surely have followed. So we avoided a nuclear catastrophe in the Cuban Missile Crisis, but we did it more by good luck than by good management. 
when most Americans learned from the Cuban Missile Crisis that it was a great American victory. Kennedy and Khrushchev had faced off and Khrushchev had blinked. What I learned from the Cuban Missile Crisis is that we nearly blundered into a nuclear war and that we avoided a civilization ending crisis more by good luck than by good management. The third transformative event in my life <clears throat> occurred in 1980, <clears throat> another period of intense Cold War hostility. At the time, I was the Under Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, responsible for the development of modern weapons, digital weapons, to offset the numerical superiority <clears throat> of the Red Army, whom we believed was posed to dominate Europe. And I got a co phone call at three o'clock in the morning. And the voice on the other end of the line identified himself as the watch officer at the North American Air Defense Command. And the first thing he told me was his computers were showing 200 ICBMs, long range missiles, <clears throat> on the way from the Soviet Union to the United States. For one horrible moment, <clears throat> I thought we were about to relive the Armageddon that we had so na narrowly avoided in the Cuban Missile Crisis. Luckily, he quickly informed me that he had concluded his computers were in error, that this was a false alarm. And he was calling me to see if I could help him determine what had gone wrong with his computers. Well, the, the short answer was it took us several days to figure that out. It was a faulty chip in the computer, nothing more. And an earlier false alarm, <clears throat> The problem had been not a machine error, but a human error. So our early warning system is a wonderful, fantastic piece of technology. But humans do err and machines do err. And we have had three false alarms that I'm aware of, none of which happily resulted in a launch because had it been a launch, the president had no way of calling it back if he had later discovered it was a false alarm. Before the watch officer called me, he had earlier called the White House. The National Security Advisor answered the phone. He believed, this was a big Brzezinski, he believed that the launch actually was underway and was about to call the president to wake him up to make the decision whether he should launch his missiles right away before the Soviet missile had impacted and destroyed our IPCBMs in the silos. Before he woke up the president, he got the second call telling him it was a false alarm. And that is when, after the president, after the White House had been notified it was a false alarm, that is when the, the watch officer called me. So that was another transformative event in my life. And what I learned from that event was that we nearly blundered into a nuclear war. And we avoided that again, more by good luck than by good management. The fourth event occurred in 1995, a few years after the Cold War had ended. We had somehow avoided the nuclear Armageddon during the Cold War. And we were in the early stages of building a post Cold War world. At the time I was Secretary of Defense and I had two primary goals, building a positive relationship with Russia and dismantling the deadly nuclear legacy of the Cold War. I succeeded in moving towards both of those goals. Between a joint effort of myself and the Russian Minister of Defense and the Ukrainian Minister of Defense, we dismantled 8,000 nuclear weapons during my term in office, 8,000. We also developed a close working relationship among the three defense ministers. A year or so later, when our troops went into Bosnia, we had a problem because Russia also wanted to send troops into Bosnia, but we did not want to have two different sets of troops in there under different commands. My job given to me by President Clinton was to persuade the Russian defense minister to deploy his brigade as part of an American division reporting to an American general. That was a hard sell, but he agreed to do that partly because of the good trust we had built up 
<clears throat> during the dismantling operation. What I learned from these experiences was that a positive construction relationship with Russia was possible and that we could achieve our security goals without nuclear weapons. Indeed, I came to believe that nuclear weapons were a liability to our security. When I left office in 1997, we were in the early stages of dismantling the nuclear arsenal that we had believed was critical to our security during the Cold War. In a few years after I left, the dismantling operation stopped both in the United States and Russia. Our attention to security issues was soon directed to the war in Iraq, and all discussion of nuclear forces and force structure disappeared. Disheartened by the reality that we were still deploying nuclear Cold War weapons two decades after the ending of the Cold War, George Shultz, George Shultz had a conference at Stanford on the 20th anniversary of the Reykjavik summit where Reagan and Gorbachev came very close to an agreement to dismantle the nuclear arsenals of both countries. <clears throat> the purpose of the conference was to revisit that near agreement. And when we did, we concluded that it was time to implement the idea that Reagan and Gorbachev almost agreed to. To that end, I joined Schultz, Kissinger, and Nunn in writing an op-ed for the Wall Street Journal, explaining our views and proposing that the world move toward the abolition of nuclear weapons. We followed the op-ed with a video called The Nuclear Tipping Point, where we showed around the country as a way of educating the public on nuclear dangers. Our op-eds and video were a shock to Americans, most of whom had forgotten altogether about our nuclear arsenal and had no idea how it endangered them. Then in February 2007, just a month after Obama took office as president, he made his famous speech in Prague. <clears throat> I speak clearly and with commitment, the commitment of the United States to seek the peace and security of the world without nuclear weapons. Obama then invited to the White House, the four of us and our spouses, talked strategy with us and then took us to the White House theater where he showed a video. He introduced it by telling his team that the video represented his ideas on nuclear weapons and hoped that it would represent theirs as well. And for the first time, I began to allow myself to believe that we might actually succeed in our mission impossible. A year, after, a year later, Obama negotiated the New START Treaty with President Vietnam. That was intended to start the process of dismantling the nuclear arsenals of our two countries. The treaty was in fact a modest first step and included very strict verification procedures. So I assumed it would breeze through the Senate ratification. Well, <clears throat> I was wrong. It was blocked by a strong coalition with enough votes to prevent the two thirds majority needed for ratification. After the Senate had adjourned for the season, Obama met with the leaders of the coalition and made an agreement by which he agreed to support a complete rebuilding of our nuclear arsenal and they agreed to ratify the treaty. I thought that price was too high and apparently President Obama did too. From then on, he stopped his pursuit of nuclear objectives in favor of other goals. And with that, the mission impossible being by, pursued by the four of us died. But I was not ready to give up. If at this time we could not get rid of nuclear weapons, perhaps we could at least take actions to reduce the danger they pose to our country and the world. So I started a small nonprofit organization, the W.J. Perry Project, to promote such actions by educating the public on the dangers and on reasonable political steps they could take to reduce those dangers. During the past six years, our little team has given countless talks and lectures, written dozens of papers, prepared two videos and two books, My Journey at the Nuclear Brink, and The Button. The Button was written in conjunction with Tom Kalina and was just released this June. It was written specifically to reach an audience not educated on nuclear issues and more specifically, a younger audience. 
the headline issue in the book was presidential sole authority. We wanted everyone to know that the president had the authority and the communication equipment to start a nuclear war in a matter of minutes. The communication equipment called the football is with him 24 seven. He probably would consult with advisors before he sent a launch command, but he may feel that he doesn't have the time to or the need to. Another issue we highlight in the book is our quick launch procedures. We argue that they are not needed and they make us dangerously vulnerable to an accidental war. My earlier story today on one of the false alarms we suffered was designed to illustrate that danger. Our most recent project is a new podcast called At the Brink, which we launched last month. We particularly wanted to get our message across to a younger audience, and we thought that podcasts might be the best vehicle for doing that. Because I was pointing our podcast to a younger audience, I asked my granddaughter to manage and narrate it, and I believe that she did a terrific job. Don't let me scare away this audience by saying I was trying to reach my younger audience, which I was. Try it yourself. I think you'll like it. I confess that sometimes I get discouraged by the difficulty in convincing our public that they are facing a nuclear catastrophe and that they must get concerned with these issues and take some relatively simple actions to lower that danger. And sometimes I reflect that I'm 92 and perhaps I should hang it up and let the younger generation take over this fight. But I have promised my 12 grandchildren that I will not do so. Or in the words of Robert Frost, the woods are lovely, dark, and deep. But I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. I thank you. Dr. Perry, I sincerely hope that many people who've been listening will join you in this journey, taking miles to go before we all sleep. And I urge everyone watching to go to the William Perry Project. It is probably uh, the best deep dive in educating in, in, a, in a clear, simple way of educating yourself on the reality of the scope, the size, the risks, and avenues for eliminating this threat. I, uh, my background, uh, Secretary Perry, is in law, as you know, and people don't realize that not only was it a moral commitment that uh, Ronald Reagan made when he said a nuclear war can never be won and must never be fought, which, he, which, he, which uh, was a uh, statement that he and President Gorbachev said at the summit in Geneva and put in motion the end of the Cold War, um, but it, there's a legal aspect to it. During, during Richard Nixon's administration, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty entered into force. And if, of course, it has stopped the proliferation of nuclear weapons, kept the number of states very small. But the five P5, the permanent members of the Security Council, agreed in that treaty that in exchange for over 180 nations is de de denying themselves the capacity and right to build nuclear weapons, that they would negotiate the disarmament process. They would negotiate the elimination of nuclear weapons as a legal obligation. And the International Court of Justice has unanimously ruled that there is a legal obligation of all states to pursue in good faith negotiations leading to a legal instrument or instruments eliminating nuclear weapons. Now, this issue is, is, has always been a bipartisan uh, bipartisan, but today it's uh, largely become partisan. And the danger, not only the danger has, uh, we realize more of the danger even than, than we did at the time when you were uh, watching the Cuban Missile Crisis. There are climatologists now to explaining to us that if less than 1% of the 13,000 weapons in the world today were to go off, it would throw at least 5 million tons of soot into the stratosphere ending the agricultural base of our modern civilization. So we've gone from mutually assured destruction, mad, to realizing that if you, if you use your arsenal, you also die. And uh, it's self-assured destruction, sad. And yet the public is largely in denial of this legal obligation, in denial of the magnitude of the threat, 
and in denial of the legitimacy of experts like yourself bestowing on the issue of the imperative. So uh, the, I'm the president of the Global Security Institute and one of our programs is, uh, it, and our board has Mikhail Gorbachev on it, Jane Goodall, Oscar Arias, it, it, and one of the programs that we have is Parliamentarians for Nuclear Nonproliferation and Disarmament. We have 800 parliamentarians all around the world. The rest of the world, the majority of people in the world are in nuclear weapons free zones. People don't know that. 115 countries in nuclear weapons free zones. And parliamentarians who care about the environment, who care about cooperation in addressing the COVID virus, they're the same parliamentarians who want to work for a nuclear weapons free world. Dr. Perry, what, uh, what, do you, what, do you, what, what do you want to tell this very powerful audience that we're speaking to, what they can do to help move the ball forward? Well, first of all, get educated on the problem. If you understand the danger, you'll be motivated to do things. And then secondly, pick out one thing that you might be able to want to do. For example, we have right now pending in legislature. Um, we will not be passed this year, of course, they might have another chance next year two different proposals, one of which was to, to end presidential sole authority. That would be perhaps nothing more dangerous than the fact that the, that the president, any president, can start a nuclear war in a few minutes just by his own decision to do so. We want to end that. Our constitution, after all, calls for the Congress and the power to declare a war, and nothing could be more a declaration of war than launching nuclear weapons at somebody. Secondly, there's legislation to try to end the, the, the quick launch procedures we have. So get educated in the problem. Discover that the two such things, that are, that are two specific proposals being made that could make a big difference in our safety and find a way of getting behind those. Well, you know, in, under the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty, there are conferences every five years in which commitments are made by nations. And the United States has made commitments to fulfill its disarmament uh, uh, legal obligation under that treaty uh, to one uh, end nuclear testing. So we, it seems to me, we need to ratify the test ban treaty. Uh, two, negotiate a treaty to cut off the any further production of nuclear uh, weapons capable material, fissile materials. Strengthen the international inspection and safeguard regime. And uh, and 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 but most important articulate consistently a commitment, a commitment to lower the operational status and political significance of these weapons. And thus in the United States, as did 190 other countries, made an unequivocal undertaking to obtain the elimination of nuclear weapons in that treaty. So this is not something that is by any stretch of the imagination, a, a, a marginal issue. But where are we today? The uh, June uh, 11th, 2019 statement of the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, said, integration of nuclear weapons into a theater of operations requires the consideration of multiple variables. Well, what does that mean? I mean, you gotta think about it. Using nuclear weapons could create conditions for decisive results and the restoration of strategic stability. Specifically, the use of a nuclear weapon will fundamentally change the scope of a battle and create conditions that affect how commanders will prevail in a conflict. That's a long way from Ronald Reagan, a nuclear war can never be won and must never be fought. It lowers the, it lowers the standard of using them to claiming that the theater use of nuclear weapons could bring about strategic stability. This, this, this passes beneath the radar of the public. Most people think the only reason we have them is to prevent them from being used. This indicates the contemplation of using them in, 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 in theater operations. Is, are we safer now or more, or, or more vulnerable than we were at the height of the Cold War? I believe, I believe that today, the likelihood of a nuclear catastrophe is greater than it was at any time during the Cold War. And that's not just my belief. The Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, which puts out their famous doomsday clock every year, has set the minute hand 
<clears throat> to less than two minutes before midnight. The lowest it ever was during the Cold War was two minutes to midnight. So in their judgment, in the judgment of their scientists, we are closer to nuclear war today. We're closer to nuclear catastrophe today than at any time in history, than at any time during the Cold War even. I think, I think that this, uh, this uh, short dialogue with you, Dr. Perry, uh, commands more time to flesh out what people can do. But I want to just urge everyone to go to the William Perry Project and go to the Global Security Institute's website, gsinstitute.org. But I also want to remind people, if you want to stay young at heart, if you want to stay and uh, have, your, have, your, have your mind be uh, at, at the height of alacrity and clarity well into your 90s, and follow the path of Dr. Perry. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much.